I watched him uh, go through the process of writing this book and just the excruciating amounts. The, it, you can't overestimate how much digging and research is required to write a book like this. I mean, the footnotes alone, they're, they're, they're incredible. And uh, I, 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 I have all my employees read this. I mean, it, it is a real, very good foundation of the history of, of Monopoly and the, the fights over uh, who is, who is going to be in power. Um, and so, you know, it gives me great joy to introduce Matt. Uh, the book is called Goliath, The Hundred-Year War Between Monopoly Power and Democracy. And I also want to uh, do a quick plug on his, his email newsletter, Big, which I find uh, incredible, also really interesting. He looks at a different monopoly every few days, every week, and he really digs in just, just with the same rigor that he uh, produced this book. He uh, does that on a regular basis with the email uh, newsletter, big. Uh, he is, uh, so he's an author. He used to be on the Senate Budget, Budget Committee. And he also uh, you know, has a, a great background in financial services as well. So he's just uh, incredibly talented. And please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Teddy. Um, it's exciting to be here. I'm a little bit. Uh, spicy and distracted because of uh, because of Iowa, actually. So um, I might uh, I'm going to talk about uh, monopoly and the history of populism, um, but uh, I might get a little distracted. Anyway, so what what's happening here? Um, and I think it's really fascinating. I think one of the things that Teddy's brought together is uh, something unusual that we haven't seen in probably 80 years, 70, 80 years in American history, which is sort of this smashing together of the kind of social justice world with the investment world, right? Where the debates are starting to be between people who care and think about social justice and people who have capital to deploy. It's always sort of been there, but um, in 1970s, we kind of took a turn where social justice became about things that didn't involve political economy. And now, because of the financial crisis, because of a whole series of, of um, Political tr uh, trends. The um, uh, we are recentering our politics on business and commerce, and so what we're starting to see is the populist movement, both on the right and on the left, is increasingly stronger in recognizing that social justice in America flows through the marketplace. Okay, so with that said, um, right now I am going to try to represent uh, what I think is happening kind of out there in terms of anger, we are seeing a lot of discussion over sort of capitalism, socialism, uh, Medicare for all, various questions of political economy. What's really happening, and people don't necessarily see it this way yet, but they, they are starting to, is we have a crisis of monopoly, right? It's not a crisis of capitalism, it's a crisis of concentration. So if you look at every market, um, big ones, search and social, cable, airlines, you have concentration, but also you can see them in small markets too. So you know, um, uh, syringes, or, or I, I just did a piece on, on cheerleading, that Netflix series, Cheer. Turns out there's a monopoly owned by Bain Capital that controls cheerleading. Um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, you just saw in Iowa, the, basically the Democratic Party is structured like, like a cartel. Um, th there's just a, a ton of, of really fascinating kind of nuggets, nooks and crannies, um, office supplies, uh, plagiarism, checking software, like just kind of everywhere you're seeing uh, concentration. And, uh, and concentration is, uh, when you think about it in social justice terms, uh, it's a system of control. It's a system of autocracy. It is as a political system. And it is um, in tension with democracy. So that's what my book is about. Now, I'm not going to talk about monopoly, because I think uh, what you're, I'm going to talk about what populism as politics means and why you're seeing an increase in anger on the right and the left. Um, OK, so uh, I studied, my book is, I'm, I stu it starts in 1910, but I really studied more in the 1920s and 30s. So I'm going to draw an analogy today to what happened in the 1920s and 1930s. But that doesn't mean that you, um, this is the only analogy or that it's um, entirely appropriate. Um, but. Uh, but it is the, the one that I know well. So, so it's about populism. And populism is a kind of politics in which 
property-owning Americans, right, um, the broad middle, uh, frustrated at broken promises from political and financial elites, they take matters into their own hands and they start a process of educating and organizing. Now, it's named after the original populist movement was uh, farmers and merchants in the 1880s and 1890s, largely in the South and the Midwest, frustrated at banks and railroads. Um, there's a lot of politics in terms of how historians characterize populism, so the Europeans have an entirely different definition, which is wrong. Um, but uh, but that's the, it's a sort of left movement of, of broad sort of small property owners against concentrated capital. Um, but it has to do with a broken promise. Now in the 1880s and 90s, that promise was the Homestead Act, which was basically a way of, during the Civil War, right after the Civil War, was giving small plots of land largely to white families. And what you saw in the 1870s, 1880s was a roll up of this land by concentrated capital. It was a feeling of a broken promise and you saw political organizing around that. And that largely structured the Democratic Party um, and the philosophy of the Democratic Party in the 1920s and 30s. Well, what is the broken promise today, right? Well, I'm gonna focus on one particular one, which I think people will recognize very obviously, which is student loans. Now, like the Homestead Act, the New Deal was this broad redistribution of property. It was sort of institutionalized in the, in the World War II and post-World War II era. And what we saw was most people were linked, majority of Americans, although not all of them, were linked to the elite through a housing finance system and an educational system. Your home was your property, and it rooted you in a neighborhood and a school. So um, no man who owns his own house and lot can be a communist, said William Levitt. He has too much to do, right? That's William Levitt, the founder, the creator of the first, one of the first post-war suburbs. Now, the, um, uh, I, I think the great political philosophers in American history are, are real estate developers. Um, so the um, second part of this deal were, were, was higher education. So tens of millions of people got educated and got into a managerial class and a secure income, and then you didn't do that, you got union rights, but either way, uh, you, you used that position to uh, live in those homes and service those mortgages. Um, so that was a deal. That was called the New Deal, or it was called the Fair Deal. It was an actual deal, right? Um, now, from the 1980s onward, the deal shifted. It didn't end. Reagan restructured the deal. He deunionized the country, and the house became a financial asset, increasingly used to secure more borrowing to mask the deterioration in American household balance sheets, swapping out credit growth for income growth, but you still got to buy things. And higher education was increasingly a mechanism not just to become more civically engaged or to enter a managerial class, but uh, to become a borrower in return for getting into a higher salaried position. So Bill Clinton, in the 1990s, he kind of doubled down on the Reagan era, and he said, uh, this is, he made this point, he said, in today's knowledge-based economy, what you earn depends on what you learn. So by the 2000s, our houses were ATMs, and student loans were on their way to becoming one of the biggest borrowing categories in America. So George Bush made this uh, observation about um, about a higher education, saying it's part of the social contract, and Barack Obama said it too. Uh, in this economy, he said, a higher education is the surest route to the middle class. That was the deal, that was the promise. If you go to, co if you go to college and take out debt, you get a secure life. Okay. Now in 2011, I spent time in Zuccotti Park, which is in Lower Manhattan, which was the site of the original Occupy Wall Street protests. Now, one thing I found interesting there was just how many people had student debt, and they noted that they had student debt. One of the things that's, I mean, I think the people that worked on foreclosures understand that when people are in debt and they are, they are unable to pay their debt, they feel ashamed of themselves. It's a very common, that's why there wasn't a tremendous political reaction, is because people blame themselves for what was, for the debt that they, they incurred, even if, even if it was the bank that put it on them or, or whatnot. But what started happening at Occupy Wall Street is people started saying, you know what, it's not my fault. I have this debt. Um, it's a broken promise to me. It's not debt I incurred um, and that I can't pay back because I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person. But at the time, the amount of student debt was about $900 billion, a lot of money. Um, but like clock, clockwork, it has increased at $100 billion a year. So now it's about $1.6 trillion or so, and it's reshaping how young people organize their lives, um, start families, buy houses, take jobs. 
44 million Americans had student debt in 2018. It's actually not just young people. There are 5 million people between the ages of 50 and 55 who have student debt, and the number of people with student debt over 60 has doubled um, since 2008. Now, the foreclosure crisis was, was pretty gruesome, but it, was, but it is over. People lost their homes, and that was that. But student debt is ongoing. Now, one in four student debt borrowers have default within five years. Um, there's a lot of horror stories would go into them, but um, uh, you can just probably talk to anyone in this room who's you know under 40. Um, uh, but the point isn't that it's a bad social problem. There are a lot of social problems. There are a lot of injustices. The point is that it was a promise. If you go to college, you get access to the middle class, to a secure life. And it was a lie. That's the point. Now, a little over 100 years ago, the broad middle of Americans were told that they were going abroad to fight for democracy. A quarter of the adult male population between the ages of 18 and 31 served in the military during World War I. And half were part of the American Expeditionary Forces. About 115,000 died. Now, soldiers in the war were paid a dollar a day, which um, those who stayed behind got double or triple that without risking life or limb. Now, it's always a little bit weird to be like, oh, it was a dollar a day, because that could be, you know, a thousand dollars, you know, and there were Nickelodeon movie theaters and stuff like that. But a dollar a day, even then, was not very much. Um, what made this worse, what made this a problem, actually, not made it worse, but what made it a problem, as people were willing to sacrifice, was that corporations who sold material to the government for the war made large sums of money. So explosive maker DuPont, for example, earned $82 million in 1916, which was 10 times its average earnings before the war. So the company paid out large dividends and salaries and had enough left over to buy 25% of General Motors. Um, now, it wasn't just that they made a lot of money, because if you were working domestically, your salary went up. There was a lot of demand for labor. It was after the war, there were huge tax rebates to corporations. And you didn't get anything if you had just fought in the war and were underpaid. So veterans of the war began agitating to get from the government the difference between what they would have been paid had they remained at home and what they were paid at war. They sought to make good on that promise. Their opponents called this a bonus to make them seem greedy. You want a bonus for fighting for your country? You know, you don't, you're not patriotic for profit. That was kind of the idea. Now, the fight happened, and it was kind of low level, and the veterans protested, but they quieted down in the 1920s for three reasons. First, very important, was the prosperity of the decade. Now, it was a long boom. It was deeply unequal. I go into this in, in the book, but it was, uh, it was quite sharp. It was, it was a real boom. The second was arguments from uh, big business and uh, across the political spectrum. Bankers largely organized veterans' politics by organizing a new well-funded veteran group called the American Legion, which was organized by veterans who were bankers. Thomas Edison spoke out against the bonus. Um, the, uh, the left opposed the bonus as well, with the nation and the new republic calling it a special interest payout. A progressive senator argued that a nation whose citizenship has been drugged and debauched by subsidies and gratuities and bonuses has taken the road over which no nation has ever yet been able to effect a successful retreat. Of course, it was super racist, right, because it's the 1920s. So in 1920, the US Chamber of Commerce argues that if the bonus were paid out, the half million Negroes in the South who probably would receive five or $600 each would immediately quit work until the money was spent. Most important, the veterans quieted down. This is the third reason. Because they got their pay deferential, sort of. In 1925, or 24, Congress passed, over the president's veto, a bill giving veterans a bonus certificate they could redeem in 1945, so 20 years later. Um, they couldn't borrow against it. They couldn't redeem it instantly. But they, they, would, get, they would get it in 1945. Um, the government also spent large amounts on veterans. So in 1928, 18% of the federal budget went to veterans <coughs> programs. Now, when they went off to fight for democracy, they were promised a slice of the American pie, and they, they got some of it. You know, they didn't get everything that they wanted, but they did get a slice. What happened, though, in 1929, stock market crashes. The Depression starts out as just your standard recession, starts getting worse and worse and worse. And the promise 
fairly meager to begin with, but somewhat honored breaks down. So in 1932 and 33, the economy collapses uh, so totally that it seemed unimaginable. Uh, banks froze up. Um, and uh, business people who had their savings in banks lost everything. There's a lot of really great commentary at the time, but we have not, I mean, some of you went through the financial crisis on Wall Street and you saw how you know, the repo markets froze up. You saw a bank run in real time and it's terrifying, right? Most people didn't actually have never experienced a bank run, but uh, in, in the 1920s and 30s, they, they were experiencing bank runs on a regular basis and they would write about them and say, you know, this is worse than gangsterism. Right, because you could go to work and your business didn't just couldn't pay you because they didn't have any money, or you would lose everything. It was terrifying, and then you know you have to carry on a lot, a lot of cash. Then there'd be lots of crime. Um, so that's what was happening, 1932, 30, 33. Um, so in 32, up to 250,000 people in Philadelphia were facing actual starvation, actual starvation after a relief committee headed by a leading city banker just ran out of funds. In Toledo, 60,000 out of 300,000 people stood in a bread line every single day. People are ready to commit suicide because of their inability to get a job and inability to live. They are blue, they are depressed, they do not know where to turn. That was the National Catholic Welfare Council. Now there's a song, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Uh, it was the most popular and dangerous song of the early depression. I say it was dangerous because the Republicans tried to ban it. Democrats used it as sort of their unofficial campaign song. Um, I don't want to read the lyrics because they're really weird. It's like 1920s, you know, ragtime stuff. So it's like one of the lines is full of that Yankee doodly dumb, but whatever. Anyway, the song is about the song is about is about a broken promise. It's about a, a guy who you know built skyscrapers, built railroads. Um, uh, fought in World War One. I. I mean, you got to remember a lot of the, you know, the corporate America had only been cr constructed really in the 1890s. So it was within lived memory for people to remember a company, a country without large corporations and even without railroads um, or without many railroads. And so this song is about people who built all that and then went off to fight the war. And then the ending line is, is of course, brother, can you spare a dime? Right? That's the humiliation, that broken promise from the broad middle. Okay, so that's the promise Americans felt was broken. And the result in 1932 was an Occupy Wall Street style protest, an encampment in Anacostia, DC, with tens of thousands of veterans. And it wasn't, it was like Occupy Wall Street, but it wasn't Occupy Wall Street, because it wasn't like kind of lefty types and drum circles. It was actually people who thought of themselves as kind of bonus expeditionary force. These were veterans, they marched. You know, they didn't have drum circles, they actually, you know, drummers and stuff. Um, and the main character of the book, this guy named Wright Patman, led a crusade to honor the bonus certificates. He was part of a group that were called inflationists in Congress. These were proto-Keynesians. And they realized that paying out cash wasn't just sort of good social policy. It wasn't just going to help their constituents, but it would also help jumpstart the economy. It was a political philosophy change about how we should run monetary policy. And it was Patman's bill to pay out the bonuses immediately that induced these veterans to come to DC. So the bonus army was started by a veteran who said, hey, everybody seems to have a lobby. All the banking, bankers have lobbies. Why shouldn't we? And he hopped the train uh, and encouraged others to hop a train, which you could do because it was you know, the 1920s or 30s. Uh, and it became this whole publicity thing. And then tens of thousands of people uh, went to Anacostia. It was similar to what you saw with Occupy Wall Street with all that kind of publicity around it. Now, um, Herbert Hoover opposed the bonus. And uh, his Secretary of the Treasury, who was the monopolist and private equity baron, Andrew Mellon, opposed it even more so. <coughs> Andrew Mellon had been the Treasury Secretary since 1921, 1921 to 1932. He's the guy who put Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill. He owned three Fortune 500 companies and sort of helped run them while he was at Treasury. Um, the joke about Andrew Mellon is that he served, um, or three, three presidents in the 1920s and 30s served under him. Um, <laughs> I, that never gets a laugh because I, I don't I don't think it's a funny joke, but you guys do. So you're, you're like that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so uh, just to give you a sense of how out of touch Herbert Hoover was, and and I think you can imagine there are a bunch of people who are out of touch today. Um, he worked 18-hour days. He was an incredibly hard worker. He was known as the great engineer. 
considered this brilliant progressive genius who saved millions after World War I doing uh, food distribution. But he was a complete disaster as president. So he worked 18 hours a day, uh, because he, and he couldn't shake his belief that the crisis was simply one of confidence. That there weren't, it wasn't that there were problems in the banking system, because the people who ran the banking system were naturally fit to rule. He was conservative, that's what he thought. So, and this, even as reporters that he knew were going broke and pleading for help, every evening, and this is actually a quote from my book, because I, I, but I just love this. So every evening, Hoover sat down to a black tie dinner and had a complete seven course meal. Hoover knew that this seemed callous, but he feared that not indulging would signal a lack of belief on his part in the imminent return of prosperity. This is like Bernanke's green shoots, but like really committing to it. In one famous instance, an apple wholesaler disposed of an apple surplus by selling them on credit to the unemployed who would resell them for a nickel each, leading briefly to shivering apple sellers everywhere. Hoover responded to a question about these men by saying, many people have left their jobs for the more profitable one of selling apples. Okay, that's Herbert Hoover. Now, a labor leader finally told Congress, I want to assure you, gentlemen, that if the Congress of the United States and this administration does not do something to meet this situation adequately, next winter it will not be a cry to save the hungry, but it will be a cry to save the government. This is when Hitler was rising in Germany. I mean, it's not, it's not crazy to imagine that kind of thing happening in the US at that time. Now, the Battle of the Bonus shaped the New Deals, before the New Deals, before FDR. And as the fight was happening, the Democrats were choosing their nominee, and they were split between Al Smith, who was financed by the DuPont interest. And when I say financed, I don't just mean his campaign was financed. I mean, they just, he was a governor of New York in the 1920s, and DuPont had just put money in his pocket the whole decade. And he wanted to run on prohibition and social issues. And his opponent was this guy named Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was kind of came out of that um, little bit of that populist tradition. He was supported by the populists in the West and the South, including um, William Jennings Bryan's like assistant, who you know, was really into FDR. Um, but they were having that fight. And uh, as that fight was happening, Patman filed articles of impeachment against Mellon, who was the most ardent foe of the bonus. And Hoover fired him, realizing how desperately unpopular Mellon had become. Now, Hoover determined that the government shouldn't be coerced by mob rule, right? And he ordered General Douglas MacArthur, then the Army Chief of Staff, to drive the veterans from the city. Troops from the 3rd Cavalry, led down Pennsylvania Avenue by George Patton himself, wielded naked sabers, followed by machine gun detachment, bayonet-equipped infantrymen, and six tanks, which tore up the city's asphalt. MacArthur was an asshole. At first, the veterans waved at the soldiers, believing it a parade of active duty troops saluting war veterans. They were like, hey, we fought in World War I. You guys are soldiers. We have you know, a lot in common. But then the soldiers charged. They led by, led by Patman, uh, Patton and on the orders of MacArthur in full formal uniform with boots polished to a glass shine. The soldiers did not distinguish between speculators and protesters, and it had become a big sort of tourist attraction. So a tear gas canister landed at the foot of a United States senator. It wasn't super well thought through. The soldiers burned the shacks of the marchers so they couldn't return, and this included burning a whole bunch of American flags. Now, Wright Patman was horrified, as were most of Congress. And you know, the, the marchers were not particularly popular until the soldiers burned down their encampments and burned down the flags and tear gassed everyone. Then, they, then people were like, oh, that seems like an overreaction. So Patman says, these ragged and hungry people have as much right to petition Congress as those who arrive in Washington on special trains, which was kind of like the private jet of the 1930s. Has the president adopted the policy of using the army to drive lobbyists from Washington? Franklin Delano Roosevelt took a different lesson, realizing he wouldn't have to campaign to beat Hoover because Hoover would beat himself. Now, what effect of all of these fights, grassroots and political fights in Congress, was the election of Roosevelt? <coughs> Hoover and Mellon were so wedded to their ideology that they would do nothing in the face of total collapse of the economy and the banking system. And one result was FDR won. Now, the second effect was a repudiation of an old order. 
The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization, said Roosevelt in his inaugural. It was more than just a metaphor, because the banking system at the time was shut. Mellon was put on trial for tax fraud. Right? This was not a let's look forward type of administration. Um, his corporations and his banks were broken up. Some of his companies were unionized. unionized. Hoover lived in disgrace until the 1950s. And the, the system of control over the American economy, the concentration that you saw, that we see today, was systematically dismantled. The financial system was made much smaller. Um, the government's job would be to attack concentrations of capital and then protect what Wright Patman called the plain people, allow them to band together through a variety of institutional forms, unions, co-ops, farm supports, whatnot. Now, the key philosophical change that happened in the minds of the public took place in 1932 when activists and political leaders made the case that the public had a right to structure their banks, money, marketplace, and society. They saw a broken promise and sought to have that made right. It's not the same dynamic today. We're not in a depression. One of the biggest criticisms of the Obama administration from many in his party is that he actually had a once-in-a-generation opportunity to organize the pro response to a series of broken promises precisely because of a downturn, but he did not. There have also, um, a downturn isn't always necessary for a realignment, and realignments don't always have a happy ending. We've had realignments in 1896, 1912, 1980. They did not take place during depressions. One realignment was the establishment of the Jim Crow system. Not always uh, happy endings, but sometimes we have them. We've had change elections. In 2006, 2008, 2010, 2014, 2016, 2018, uh, the only one we didn't have was when the Republicans put up a status quo style candidate, Mitt Romney. Populism happens when a large chunk of Americans feel that the promises that they had been offered were denied, and they decide to take matters in their own hands. And there are a lot of consequences of, um, of a populist political order, and I think you know what you're seeing at this conference, the kind of discussions that you're seeing from um, from a, a lot of the kind of advocates and thinkers are on the, on the sort of quasi left, um, they would, you know, in the New Deal, they would have free run, right? They would get to do what they, all their ideas, and then come up with more, right? That's what the New Deal was. It was a, a decade of that. Um, a lot of implications to that, and we can go into them, but that's kind of give you a sense of how populist politics works and why we're seeing a recurrence of it today. This book is called Goliath. We know that much. Uh, so talk to me about David. Um, who among the Democratic candidates has the best antitrust policy? I mean, I think Ber Bernie and Warren both have very assertive antitrust policies. And what they want to do is, in their own ways, um, just have clear rules. So antitrust has been done using this garbage idea of uh, called consumer welfare, which essentially says, let's have technocratic economists come up with very intricate solutions anytime there might be some sort of problem. And what um, what Bernie and Warren both kind of want to do is they, they want to just say, no, we're just going to have stop signs. So very clear rules. When you hit that end of the road, you stop. As opposed to you, when you hit the end of the road, we have an economist, pay him $3 million. He does a bunch of calculations to tell you whether you should stop or not. So let's... Um Let's talk about some specifics then with those two uh, Davids in mind. Uh, you mentioned in your speech, and you certainly in the book, uh, eulogize Wright Patman. Right. And uh, he sponsored the uh, Robinson Patman Act right. of 1935, which you explain in the book uh, was designed to make sure that the big chains could not use uh, vicious price cutting to drive small business into extinction and then, and then take their place. Right. Uh, do you agree that Amazon would be the worst nightmare uh, for uh, uh, Mr. Patman? And if you do, what do you think uh, either President Sanders or President Warren would do about Amazon? Well, first of all, I, I want to mention that that this isn't just a right, this isn't just a left wing thing. So you see people like Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio, really starting to rethink political economy on the right as well. So this is not like, you know, and you're you're seeing a lot of people in the business uh, world starting to take this seriously. The most ardent critics of my uh, book have been actually come from the left, which is very weird, um, although not unexpected. Um, I would say, you know, Amazon, I mean, the most important 
thing that Patman did, and, and this is with the great um, members of Congress, and I think you know Amanda can talk to this, but a whole bunch of people um, know this, and it's, it's congressional investigations, right? So what populism is about is, is a real rigorous understanding of our detailed institutional fabric. And then, um, you know, and then making policy to to reorder that so that commerce is more fair. So the first thing to do, and this is what I think Congressman David Cicilline is doing in the House Antitrust Subcommittee, is just figure out what these big tech corporations are, right? So Amazon is massive. It's complicated. It has lots of different components. First, you have to figure out what it is, and then you have to figure out where the difference between the areas of advantage, the sort of the scale where scale is helpful and the areas where it's purely about power. And then you go in and you just kind of break the bottlenecks of power, but try to retain you know, the, the sort of scale advantages with some sort of public utility law. But um, that's kind of Warren's plan. After your, after your page turning a tour of antitrust policy or, or populism versus monopoly, I found myself um, wishing that the book would go on and, and add one more chapter. So I'll ask you right now what, uh, what what you would write in that one more chapter. What is your hit list for companies that should be broken up? Well, first of all, talk to my editor because he my, I contracted for 100,000 words and the first draft was 270,000 words. So, <laughs> so I mean, you've already so written a chapter that I uh, wanted to read. So <laughs> what does it say? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think, uh, you know, there there is, there is no hit list because... Um, you know, you can like the. I think the most important. I guess the most important corporations. So Alex Lawson said something important, which is you know, you um, you take on you break a bunch of patents. Uh, forget which company it was, Magellan or one of those, um, and then every other pharmaceutical company sees it, right, and says, oh, we don't want that to happen, right. So it doesn't actually matter, really, which corporations you address. It you just have to go after one of the pace setters. I think the pace setter in the economy today is Amazon, Google. Facebook, um, maybe Apple, maybe Microsoft. And if you address any one of them with a real um, a, a s attempt to restructure, like if you basically move beyond you know, laws or regulations or suggestions, right? And you actually say, no, no, that, that you have to pay attention to them uh, or else you get handcuffs. If you do that, then um, everybody else, the 10,000 antitrust attorneys who advise corporations are gonna give different advice to their companies. So it's less important that you go after any particular company and more important that you go after the pace setters and that you do it aggressively and assertively. And then you, know, you empower all sorts of agencies and at a state, local level to kind of do it to, to sort of their area. I would also say I think it's really important to bring back private rights of action because you, know, you, you don't want to rely just on public uh, officials to do this. You want ordinary people to be able to do it. This was a very important aspect of how Eisenhower did antitrust. There was a very lively bar um, so, so that, you know, if you're a supplier of a company and they have a lot of power over you, you know, the, 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 if you have uh, aggressive private rights of action, then they look over their shoulder and they always know that, that if they tr mistreat you, then you can bring a suit. You have a section at uh, page 400 called The Corruption of the Democrats, where you list neoliberals, uh, Gary Hart, Bill Clinton, Al Gore. It's basically my Rolodex uh, from when I, from when I had a Rolodex instead of contacts. Uh, to my recollection, uh, they or we uh, prioritized winning culture wars and trusted technological innovation to benefit consumers more than antitrust policy. Did we really think that? Uh, and if we did, were we completely wrong? Well, what I mean. You're implying something, so it's your, you know, I'm it was originally defensive. called, it was I'm a, being defensive. <laughs> um, well, then wait, so ask that again. I'm not sure I understand the question. So when I think back uh, in the early 90s, uh, or even earlier when Gary Hart uh, was the uh, Atari Democrat, uh, the thinking then was what government ought to do uh, was to promote technological innovation and that the innovators, whoever they might be, they turned out to be Larry Page, Sergey Brin, but whoever they might be, they would bring competition and productivity gains and wealth creation to the economy, and they could do a better job than antitrust policy. 
I mean, that, yeah, that I think that's what I, I, that is what that generation thought. Um, I think that's what. So, what do you think? All wrong, somewhat wrong. Well, did, went wrong somehow. Well, so technology, technological progress is not. Um, it doesn't. You know, it how technology is deployed is a political question, right? And it's not like the New Dealers in the fifties and sixties and forties were like, oh, we don't want innovation. They just, you know, there's a quote in there from um, uh, I forget who it was. Um, but Leon Kieserling, who said, you know, we don't want, and this Eisenhower, he was a Truman ad advisor, and Eisenhower thought this too, we don't want technology to be under the control of the monopolists, right? So, you know, it wasn't that they, it was, there had been a, a tremendous amount of innovation from the, you know, 1870s all the way to the 1970s. And what changed was not um, the idea that people would promote innovation through public policy. What changed was the idea that we would have uh, how we would deploy technology, the legitimacy of who deployed technology. So it was that financial markets, uh, people in financial markets and private actors uh, with market power would be the ones to deploy technology, which just is straight up, you know, Joseph Schumpeter, um, John Kenneth Galbraith, like that's what they thought, right? And it's just very much not the way that Patman, who helped create the National Science Foundation um, and Estes Kefauver and a whole bunch of others thought about technology deployment, who thought, you know, technological deployment can serve the monopolist or it can serve the public, and we want to make sure it serves the public. And um, I, I'm not saying it was done in bad faith. I don't think Gary Hart or a lot of these actors were doing it in bad faith. I think that, that there was a legitimate view that that was the case. I mean, part of what the book is about is showing why a whole lot of people who were operating wanted social justice, wanted a better world, ended up making a whole bunch of decisions that concentrated wealth and power um, in a way that was dangerous without them really even noticing why they did it. I was like that too. I mean, I, I didn't know this stuff until the financial crisis too. So it's not like I'm very spicy on Twitter, but, but like I blame people now because I think you should understand it. But I don't think you necessarily, I didn't know when what was going on until the financial crisis. I was an idiot. You're definitely not an idiot. Uh, and no, I was. Oh, now I'm okay. now I'm amazing. <laughs> I mean, you've got two hundred and seventy-five thousand words of non-idiot, uh, and, and we've only got a hundred thousand that we've read here. Um, you do indicate a grudging respect for Bill Baxter's successful effort to break up AT and T, and and you aren't totally critical of the nineteen ninety-six Telecommunications Act. How do you think, given that the trillion-dollar companies have all come out of the communications and computing convergence, where do you think we are now with respect to uh, the Telecom Act uh, and antitrust enforcement in, of, the, uh, of that particular sector? Where do you think we are now? Well, first of all, I think there is yet to be the book. There, ha there is a great book yet to be written on the Telecom Act. Right, how that was put together, Cause, and like I don't know that much about the like in, in you know maneuvering there, but it is a I'm sure it's a fascinating story. I actually um, know all about that, um, but I think you should answer the question. <laughs> That's the one it. thing I do know all about. <laughs> um, I uh, it's a it's a really good question. I mean, I think we have um, you know the Telecom Act, but also a whole series of rules and regulations that was put in place until the 19th. So really from the 1790s until the 1970s, American telecommunications policy and media policy was about um, quarantining different layers of, of telecommunications and media structures from each other, uh, making sure that there just wasn't too much media ownership. And uh, that really started breaking down in the 1980s. That's when you saw the AM radio empires emerge, Rush Limbaugh, and then Fox News and, and cable news and a whole series of, of concentrations in the 96 uh, Cable Act, uh, or Telecom Act, really kind of got rid of a whole bunch of those uh, walls that, that prevented the emergence of giant media corporations. And then you saw the creation of giant media corporations. And then on top of that, you have this revolution in technology of Google and Facebook. And so now you have like, you know, and on top of that, they're globalized, right? So it's like this giant kind of hairball of stuff that's all smushed together. Um, I don't 100% know how to deal with it. Generally, my, you know, my one really good theory here is if it's too big, make it smaller. And so I think we're going to get to that. I think you're starting to see investigations and enforcement all over the world on these, these big guys. I think you're seeing problems like Chinese control over Disney, um, which became very obvious. 
So you're going to start to see, I think, a move to deconcentrate these areas and start to reimpose um, quarantines on the, the different business lines and how we do that and how we define those business lines. Um, we, haven't, we haven't yet started to really kind of, we're not in the end game. We don't know what it's going to look like. But I think part of it is like we're setting the terms for those divisions right now. And I think David Cicilline's investigation could do that. Yep. Uh, one last question. Uh, your book ends with a call to action. Uh, I read it as somewhat plaintive. Um, what is your assessment of the mood of your generation about the topics in this great book? Well, so I'm I'm uh, I'm like on the border of of Gen. I'm like more Gen X, so my generation doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> So we're just kind of we're less kind of like bummed and looking around, being like millennials. I hope you fix this. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, Can we I, skip the millennials and just go straight to whatever generation you want to be in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think right now what you have is a, a is a sort of the boomer and older generation. Uh, they know what they have. They're afraid of change because it's you know obviously if you lose what you have at a certain age you can't get you know there's no new career waiting right so and and they're organized right they're used to voting they're used to wielding power they own most assets and then people who are kind of 45 and under 40 and under some breakdown there you know it's basically the line is people that that owe student debt right in large percentages that generational shift they just have a different. Um, they just have a different relationship to the financial system, to the to the social promise that they've been made, um, and but the the thing is, is that people who are uh, who are under uh, forty five, they just don't vote as 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 often. They don't have assets. They don't feel as empowered. They have a lot less trust in the political system. So you know, if they start voting in large numbers as traditionally a generations have, you're going to see like. It'll it'll be weird. It'll be like you know what what I've always been in politics and I've been like the people are going to really demand change and then they haven't. Um, and uh, but it, I think think what's happened is it was 20 degrees and there was an ice cube and I was waiting for the ice cube to melt and we put a lot of effort into it and it went from 20 degrees to 30 degrees and it was like oh nothing happened right. But it's not that the temperature didn't change. It's just that we didn't hit that that point. Well, once you get to you know above 32 degrees. Um, it, you, you have a phase shift. So I think one day, you know, relatively soon, we're going to hit a phase shift. And it's happening on the right, too. I mean, this is not like, this is not like a democratic thing, right? You've got a lot of young uh, Republican types who are really interested in this. You've got a lot of people in the Pentagon. Basically, everybody is like, go away, boomers, right? That's like the, the general feeling, a generational feeling across every institution. And one day, uh, fairly soon, that is going to, you're just going to see a massive systemic restructuring similar to what you saw in the early 1980s when Reagan came in or in the 1930s um, or you know in the 1890s like this happens periodically and that's where we're, we're getting to folks let's give a big round of applause to our terrific author